Keynote 3 shall now commence. The speaker is Mr. Nasuno Futoshi, Director General for Industrial Science and Technology Policy and Environmental Bureau at Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. Mr. Nasuno, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nasuno. I am the Director General for Industrial Science and Technology Policy and the Environmental Bureau. Today, I'm going to talk about the transition finance, uh, what we do towards the carbon neutral, and what we are doing at the uh, METI. Please. In the Paris Agreement, toward the end of this uh, uh, century, uh, we really have to have the uh, balance between the uh, production of the CO2 and also uh, reduction of the CO2 and uh, have to make efforts towards the uh, below 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's a commitment that we made. To achieve this, we really have to invest massively into various industries. For example, the sustainable investment, if you look at the left hand side bottom, ESG related, um, there is a growing interest in the ESG investment 2020, 35.6 trillion dollars, but yet uh, the investment itself is not sufficient. So uh, when it comes to green bond, uh, this is a bond uh, to raising fund for uh, climate change, and which is uh, $269.9 billion and for 2020. But when it comes to green bond, the, uh, these are uh, issued for energy and buildings. So uh, steel, cement, and uh, chemical plants uh, for these uh, industries are the uh, high uh, CO2 emissioners, but uh, it shares only 0.4% in the uh, green bond, so that uh, it is clearly that we do not have enough investment. So, we have to go towards the Paris Agreement and uh, the renewable energy plays a very important role, but uh, that itself is not sufficient to achieve the target. Um, we have to have the transitional finance to go towards the decarbonized society. The fundraising for the transition process have to be secured so that uh, R&D uh, can be promoted and also CAPEX can be also uh, expanded based on the fundraised uh, for this transition process. So all the companies cannot really go to zero emission uh, overnight. Uh, we have to support the transition uh, period from the current society to the decarbonized society, and we have to do that. So, um, we decided to focus on the transition period, and uh, uh, we created the transition finance the concept to support uh, financially the companies uh, during the transition period. Last year, December, the uh, ICMA's um, Climate Transition Finance Handbook was published. And based on this handbook, the METI and also the FSA and also Environmental Ministry have formulated the basic guidance 
own uh, transition finance so that uh, we put the label on the uh, finance such as transition bonds and also transition loans and that was done in May this year for each industry we uh, look at the qualification of the transition fundraising so uh, we are in process of producing the roadmap for each different industry this is a contents of the basic guidelines um, when we uh, we dis label the transition bond and uh, we set the uh, concept and then criteria to uh, label some bond as transition bond. So this is not just about the use of the fund, but also we focus on the company's transition strategy towards the uh, zero uh, emission target. And also, the trajectory towards the uh, decarbonization should be really based on science. And that have to be also proved to, label, to be labeled as transition fund. For these, these are the uh, area of uh, industries. The uh, first one is the high emission uh, industries. And the second one is the uh, alternative methods um, are not really financially and also economically uh, viable. So that the alternative methods to achieve zero emission uh, should be really pursued. So this fiscal year, um, as you see on the left-hand side uh, chart, uh, we formulate uh, roadmaps for seven sectors such as steel, chemicals, cement, paper, pulp, electricity, gas, and petroleum. As you see on the right-hand side, the uh, uh, shipping in the transportation we have already produced the uh, roadmap and working on the actual actions. So sector-specific roadmaps, uh, this is the positioning of it. The basic guidelines uh, annex uh, include these roadmaps and uh, uh, this is uh, the material to help um, evaluating the eligibility of companies' transition strategies. So uh, we uh, want to use this as the uh, technology, technology roadmap uh, for the carbon neutrality in 2050. So I mentioned about the seven sectors, but uh, the leading one is the steel industries the uh, hydrogen reductions and uh, uh, green innovation funds are supporting these different R&Ds. And uh, uh, upon this context, we are currently in the process of producing roadmaps for different sectors. So how do we use this? And uh, to show that we are uh, currently producing model project. So uh, many certified projects that meet the basic guidelines and roadmaps. And we call them a model project and uh, we subsidize those model project the maximum of 90%. So what about the uh, corporate interest in transition finance? We conducted the survey, so let me share the result of that. So first of all, the company size interest. Um, the, the companies 
uh, who, which said that they are interested in transition finance is over 50 percent, especially high emission uh, sectors are very much interested in this type of finance. Um, another survey was done for the financial institutions. Uh, about 70 percent of central and uh, local investors uh, think that the transition bond as the uh, ESG investment. So uh, METI has already certified three projects. Um, first model project was uh, uh, Japan. Uh, Japan shipping, which is the uh, investment in the LNG-driven ships, and uh, we uh, issued 20 billion yen, and also demand uh, was almost uh, 10 times. So that uh, financial institutions are very much interested in transition bond. Lastly, uh, well, I have explained about the transition finance at the METI and uh, climate innovation finance promotion scheme I touched upon. Other than that, uh, the interest subsidy scheme uh, to promote transition to the carbon neutrality. And the third one is the compensation scheme to promote the introduction of advanced low carbon equipment. So these are for leased equipment, mainly for the SMEs. And uh, by getting the uh, insurance, uh, they can reduce cost. And the two trillion yen green innovation fund for steel and the hydrogen supply chains. Um, for this type of project, the METI uh, provide grants. So with respect to green innovation fund, uh, we have fund of two trillion yen and uh, already eight hundred billion uh, amount of the uh, fund was uh, committed to different projects. So, um, what we have done and are doing in the transition finance, and also uh, I have explained about what we are doing in the financial. Uh, areas. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Mr. Nasuno, thank you for your speech. Now we would like to move on to panel discussion three, TCFD disclosures and transition strategy. The facilitator of this session is Professor Ito Kunio, Chair of the TCFD Consortium and Director of Hitotsubashi CFO Education and Research Center. Now I would like to pass the facilitation to Professor Ito. Professor Ito, please. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kunio Ito. I'm going to be your facilitator of this panel. First of all, I'd like to talk about the purpose of this panel discussion. As you know, in order to achieve carbon neutrality, companies should make efforts to improve the level of the TCFD disclosure. In addition, transition through continuous efforts to lower carbonization by using financing, as well as uh, innovation through continuous technological progress are essential. As I mentioned in the opening remarks, Japan has been trying to promote transition finance. The TCFD's proposed guidance also calls for the disclosure of transition plan, which is in line with Japan's transition finance policy. Here at this panel discussion, we'll like to talk about how to accelerate transition finance and enhance the quality of TCFD disclosure from both companies' perspectives and investors' perspectives in terms of what's going on globally, including Japan. Let me introduce, briefly introduce uh, the members who joined the panel discussion. 
from the right hand for audience, Kaya Parker, TCFD Secretary of Support, Engagement Manager, Climate Sustainability, Oliver Wyman. Michio Terakami, Executive Officer, Idemitsu Kosan. <laughs> Nicholas Puff, Head of Sustainable Finance, ICMA, the International Capital Markets Association. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. Mm -hmm. Reiko Hayashi, Director and Deputy President, DOL Security. Sergio Molisani, Finance Insurance Tax Director and Senior Vice President, International Assets, SNAM. Thank you for joining us. Before starting the discussion, let me introduce myself and briefly expl explain about the TCFD Consortium in Japan. I've been the chair of the TCFD Consortium in Japan since 2019. And I also have chaired the task force on preparation of the environment for transition finance. The task force has issued the basic guideline on transition finance this May. Transition finance no tame no kihon shishin in Japanese. As you know, the TCFD consortium is managed through cooperation by the financial, business, and governmental sectors. It has played an important role in the development of TCFD in Japan and has attracted international attention. It is a great pleasure TCFD consortium released Green Investment Guidance 2.0 today. The first version was released at the first TCFD summit two years ago, which has been utilized by many financial institutions, both domestic and abroad. And at the second TCFD summit last year, the consortium released TCFD guidance 2.0. Okay, let's get it started. First, I'd like to ask uh, Pagasan of TCFD Secretariat. Japan has been making efforts to promote transition finance as well as climate related disclosure based upon TCFD. These days, the number of cases which utilize the framework for transition finance are gradually increasing in Japan. TCFD released for consultation a proposed guidance on climate-related metrics, targets, and transition plans, and also calls for the disclosure of transition plans, as I said earlier, which seem to be in line with Japan's transition finance policy. Could you provide us with uh, relevant information about that, Paga-san? It would be my pleasure. And firstly, thank you for having me. It's really exciting to hear all the work that you're working on, on transition finance. And I'm really glad to be speaking to additional TCFD guidance on transition plans. So specifically, as you've mentioned, TCFD has issued a proposed guidance on metrics, targets, and transition plans in June this year. It was published for consultation. Um, we received a lot of responses, and the feedback truly was an astounding support for additional guidance on transition plan. So you, the, the world is really seeing value in having additional guidance on transition plans for preparers to disclose details on trans transition plans and for users to leverage that information when making financial decisions. We will be publishing a final guidance on metrics, targets, and transition plans in October 14th. So in, in nine days, you'll get to see also the results of the consultation, 
the support we received on transition plans. So please look out for that. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on it once it's published. But let's turn to my first slide, um, discussing just providing you a little bit of an overview of what is the final outcome on transition plans uh, coming from TCFD. So the task force has recognized that an organization's transition plan is actually one component of its broader strategy pillar. As you all know, TCFD is built out of the four strategies, govern, uh, four pillars, governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. And tr transition plan is a component of that strategy pillar as it addresses its climate-related risks and opportunities, and it, it it already implicitly covers key aspects of this transition plan. However, as there's increasing focus on such plans, as already discussed uh, today, the task force determined the explicit guidance may be really useful. As you see on the left hand on the left hand side of the slide in front of you, I mean a, a climate strategy is built out of actually two parts. It's built out of a transition plan and adaptation plan. At this point, TCFD is focusing on guidance on the transition plan. Additional guidance, of course, would be valuable on the adaptation plan, and we'll look at that in the future. Now, the way the task force defined the transition plan is that a transition plan is an aspect of an organization's overall business strategy that lays out a set of targets and actions supporting its transition towards a low carbon economy, including actions such as reducing its GAG emissions. As you may know, many organizations are making GAG emissions reductions commitments or are domiciled in jurisdictions that have done so. In fact, a recent study found that over 60% of countries and nearly 10% of states and regions in the largest emitting countries have committed to net zero. And out of the 2000 largest public companies, over 20% have net zero commitments. It's already been mentioned the importance and the the interest that users have for transition plans as they're seeking to verify the credibility of organizations' commitments related to climate change. Users are particularly interested in information on how organizations will adjust their strategies and, or business models, including the specific actions they will take to reduce risks and increase opportunities as they transition to a low carbon economy. A specific type of transition planning that really has gained attention recently focuses on achieving a net zero target. We've all probably read the IPCC's uh, latest report and the importance that that the GAG emissions need to decline by about 45% by 2030 and then reach net zero by 2050 in order to achieve one and a half degrees temperature target. So you know, the importance of, of a transition plan and help helping companies get to that net zero by 2050 and helping all of us get to a 1.5 degree temperature target is really increasing. Now, one last piece I wanted to share with you is the right-hand side. So TCFD has provided more guidance on exactly what a disclosure of a transition plan should have, what are some of the fundamental principles, so that the disclosure is effective and that the users, i.e. investors, um, lenders, underwriters, can make informed decisions using this transition plan feedback. So firstly, it should be aligned with strategy. So a company's broader strategy should really be aligned with the transition plans, actions, and how it intends to address climate-related risks and opportunities. It should be anchored in quantitative elements, including, including climate-related metrics and targets. Um, we've, I, a lot of you have heard previously about the metrics, um, climate-related metrics and targets that TCFD has also published today. That should be the basis of a transition plan how you intend to communicate GAG emissions, how you intend to communicate your reduction in physical risk, uh, your capital allocation, and so forth. It should be subject to effective governance process. So it should describe what is the approval process and oversight and accountability as part of a transition plan. It should have actionable specific initiatives that are credible so that the users can truly um, test its credibility. Ideally, the plan should describe, you know, organizations' current capabilities, technologies, transition pathways, financial plan. It should be periodically reviewed and updated and reported annually to stakeholders, including any reporting of progress against the transition plan and which parts were not achieved. This is just a, a, 
a high level overview of some guidance from TCFD. We hope that this will help preparers uh, deliver better disclosure on transition plans and for users to really receive more comparable standardized information on transition plans to make better investment lending underwriting decisions going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Pagarsen. Uh, as you said, uh, the TCFD will release the final version October 14th. I'm wondering if the slide you showed us uh, today would be your insider information? <laughs> you are getting a preview indeed. <laughs> uh, we, you know, thought that as it's nine days away and it's such an important uh, conference that it is worth to share a little bit of insider information. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thanks really for calling me that. out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Next, I'd like to get some comments from uh, Nicholas Parson uh, from uh, ICMA Stansley. How do you see the inclusion of transition plan to companies uh, climate related disclosure as indicated in the TCFD implementation guidance. How do you think about that? Thank you very much. And, and let me start by, by also saying what a pleasure it is to be here with you um, this afternoon in Japan, even if uh, remotely. Um, I'm the head of sustainable finance at ICMA and a member of its executive committee. I'm also the secretary of the Green and Social Bond Principles and a member of the European Commission's platform, Sustainable Finance. Um, coming to your question, I think the inclusion by the TCFD of a transition plan alongside an adaptation plan as part of a company's overarching strategy to address climate risks and opportunities is, is a key development. This is very important. I'm, I'm especially enthusiastic about the emphasis on target setting for scope one, two, and three emissions with a possible reference to a 2050 net zero objective. This target setting approach is highly compatible with the one at the product level, the financial instrument level that we've been developing over the last 18 months with the executive committee of the green and social bond principles. Indeed, we, we have identified um, sustainability linked bonds, a product that you know, for which we've released guidance uh, uh, almost a year and a half ago, um, that this instrument the sustainable link bonds is that tracks organization level commitments of issuers is especially relevant to finance transition targets. Based on key performance indicators and sustainability performance targets, sustainability linked bonds can be indeed designed explicitly to finance the organization's transition plan as defined by the TCFD. This is something I'd like to come back to later in the panel. As an additional remark, I noted that the TCFD's recommendations for a parallel adaptation plan remain pending. This is also clearly a priority with the acceleration of extreme weather and climate related disasters, such as flooding and forest fires that we've all been able to witness in 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Garson. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Pafsan. So uh, let's move on to the perspective of companies who disclose climate-related information as well as transition finance. In this respect, uh, first I'd like to ask uh, Sergio molisani -san, could you talk about uh, company TCFD disclosure efforts in general and the importance and challenges of disclosing their transition plans? What do you see are the issues to be yeah. addressed in articulating between uh, TCFD disclosure and making transition plans? Go ahead, please. Yes, can you hear me? Sure, definitely, okay. yeah. Fine, thanks. Good afternoon to everybody. First of all, thanks for inviting us to this event, allowing ourselves to share with you our experience in the sustainable finance space first. But secondly, and more importantly, probably giving us offering us a tangible evidence that there is a growing awareness in the market that uh, we need concrete and tangible action to make the decarbonization 
a credible target and not only a long-term long -term dreams. Let me take just 10 seconds to introduce SNAM. SNAM is the largest European infrastructure player with a market cap in excess of 15 billion euros and a regulated asset base in excess of 20 billion, or 20 billion euros. Uh, our environmentally and technology, technologically advanced network, which is connected to, to all the other European backbones, and with the nine entry points, the largest number in uh, the largest number in Europe, guarantees the security of supply and is a key enabler of the transition in Italy and in Europe. Uh, for a company such as SNAM, having, as mentioned before, an asset base in excess of 20 billion euro, the gross debt in excess of 15 billion euro, investing one and a half billion euro per year with the economic life of the assets of 40 to 50 years, and pointing to net carbon zero in 2040, the alignment between the corporate and the financial strategy is not a nice to have. It's not an option, it's a must to have. And uh, this is confirmed by the fact that we are a purpose-driven company. Last year, the new purpose, energy to inspire the world, has been introduced in the company in the company by law, just to testify our commitment to, to climate change. But back to, to, to your question, uh, for a company such as SNAM, having an ample access at regional cost to the financial market is crucial to sustain our long-term uh, growth. And as a result, also the financial disclosure is a key is a key game changer. In this regard, I think that uh, we are talking about our commitment to the climate change is the wide variety of uh, reports we produce in order to give a timely and an in-depth view of our activities, our performance, our objective in the climate change uh, the climate change space. And the transparency has been rewarded by the top quartile ESG ratings we have in the, in the industry. Our first sustainability report is back to 2006. And in 2018, we adhered to the CAD. And it is the third, 2020 represented the third year in a row of the publication of the document Financial Disclosure on Climate Change 2020. Of course, a good disclosure is the fruit of the good, ambitious, and the transparent targets of the company. As mentioned before, SNAM is targeting that net zero by 2040. That is the most ambitious target in the industry and is 10 years in advance the European, the European target. We have intermediate targets in 2030 for scope one and scope two, minus 50% in line with the Paris Agreement. And last but not least, we are planning in the short, in the short term to publish also scope three target as mentioned by as mentioned by by nicolas the last few numbers in our capex plan we have a capex for year capex plan of 7.4 billion euro one billion higher than the previous plan um 0 0.7 billion euro two times the amount of the last plan are dedicated to energy transition business such as hydrogen biomethane energy efficiency and sustainable mobility and 50 percent of the plan uh, it's dedicated to hydrogen ready infrastructure. What does it mean? It means replacement of existing assets and development of the new asset in line with hydrogen ready standard that, as you know, it's perfectly consistent with European taxonomy. And we have roughly speaking 40 to 50 percent of our CAPEX plan taxonomy aligned. I hope I have addressed your question. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hansen. Uh, next question goes to uh, Terra Kamisan of Eden Itzi. Uh, could you talk about TCFD disclosure efforts at your company and especially the importance and challenges of disclosing your, your company transition plans? Thank you very much for this opportunity. First, I would like to briefly introduce our company, Idemitsu. The Demitsu Group is globally engaged in businesses such as fuel oils, chemical products, high-performance materials, electric power and renewable energy, and resources. The Idemitsu Group has about 20 hundred companies and bases, with about half of them located in Japan and the other half overseas. Our corporate philosophy is truly working, and we always ask ourselves whether we are thinking of uh, country and local communities and working for them. 
and the people who live there with a strong attitude of making the impossible possible. We will contribute to the realization of carbon neutrality by 2050 by providing energy and materials that support the realization of a recycling-oriented or circular economy. I am in charge of the Regional Innovation Business Office and the Sustainability Strategy Office, and my role in the Sustainability Strategy Office is to envision new changes in society and to connect the expectations and demands of society in ESG with management strategies in order to remain sustainable no matter what environment changes occur. In the Regional Innovation Business Office, the biggest themes are countermeasures against regional population decline and the creation of key industries. Looking to the future, we aim to create regions that support infrastructure with distributed energy and operate with DX support. Our company's uh, TCFD disclosure efforts and experiences wise, we started as a sustainability strategy office in 2018. Since then, we have been proactively disclosing information in conjunction with our ESG initiatives, including joining the United Nations Global Compact signing the TCFD recommendations, participating in various research groups, and creating opportunities to deepen engagement with stakeholders. We have been quite proactive in disclosure. In disclosure of TCFD, we first drew up multiple scenarios of the business environment up to 2050, which is the uh, target of the Paris Agreement. And we refer to the forecasts of several external organizations, such as the IEA. And we assumed four scenarios ranging from an increase in oil demand in the Asia Pacific region to a dramatic uh, degree in demand as decarbonization processes toward achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. And based on these four scenarios, we have summarized and disclosed the risks and opportunities associated with climate change. The most um, advanced decarbonization scenario, which is a, a difficult a scenario for energy industries, uh, we um, put together risks and opportunities, understanding and disclose those information. The disclosure of transition plans is highly important for the energy sector, as the disclosure itself indicates the challenge to achieve a decarbonized society it is important to deepen engagement with shareholders, financial institutions, investors, and other stakeholders through disclosure to promote understanding and accelerate efforts to achieve a decarbonized society throughout the supply chain. And we believe that a decarbonized society, along with national energy policies and energy conversion or transition, will transform the lifestyles of communities and people. And this is the responsibility and the raison d'etre of energy companies. Oil development, the refinement, distribution, and the sales, we cover all of that. And we have 6,300 service stations in Japan as fuel oil supply bases. So in addition to the decarbonization of primary energy, we will contribute to the decarbonization of local economies and people's lifestyles through decentralized power sources, EVs and car sharing, starting from service stations. The challenge for TCFD disclosure would be to show concrete progress as well as technological progress as we shift our business portfolio towards the realization of a decarbonized society. That is all from me. I'd like to ask uh, Hayasan next. Uh, needless to say, disclosure is particularly important for uh, manufacturing energy company that need to uh, make uh, transitions. I have two questions first. How do financial institutions support and coordinate those companies? 
And second, how do you see the financing environment of manufacturing and energy company and the relationship between uh, TCFD disclosure and financing environment? Do I help you, hai -san? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ito. And then again, uh, thank you very much for having me to today. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, my name is Ueko Hayashi. Uh, please let me have a, a brief introduction myself. Uh, Deputy President of BOBA Securities Japan, uh, securities subsidiary uh, of Bank of America. I have been in capital markets for more than 30 years from now, and then I've been in charge of ESG in the past seven years. As a part of that, I'm a member of SDG's council at JSDA, Japan Security Dealers Association, and then also other Japan government working groups such as uh, Task Force for Pre Preparation for the Environment for Transition Finance and Sustainable Finance Experts at FSA. I'm also a board member of I ICMA, International Capital Market Association, working together with Nicholas. Hi, Nicholas. And then of which uh, you might know that set voluntary rules for green bonds or social bonds and transition finance handbook. Considering uh, today's event theme, I'd like to share some of the highlights from the report that FSA expert panel released in June. That report not only emphasized the importance of transition finance, but it also mentioned the transition strategy of corporate which use transition finance should be credible, meaning non-greenwashing, and they should be based on science grounds such as IEA's sustainable, finance scenario, sustainable development scenario and industry roadmap. Also, the report encouraged corporates to advance disclosure to be compliant with international framework such as TCFD. And what can financial institutions uh, support those transition. Um, as discussed uh, by other panelists today, transition bond or transition finance are essential across the globe for companies that are aiming to achieve carbon neutrality. This is very true for not only Japan, but also Asian countries, which are heavily reliant on fossil fuel energy. For financial institutions, including Bank of America, it is our fiduciary responsibility to work together and support our client transition. Our company has been leading this initiative, including commitment to achieve carbon zero by 2050, and then also we are looking at around $1 trillion of financing for environmental efforts, as well as 0.5 US dollar for other sustainable efforts in the coming 10 years. So we are truly committed to sustainable finance and transition. For example, as for SNAM, uh, that is one of our most important clients, <laughs> as Mr. Morisani explained, they have been working so hard to be a leader in the energy sector transition. Bank of America has been supporting SNAM with their transition journey as financial institutions since the early stage. For example, we are structuring agent of their climate action bond framework in 2019, and then also transition bond framework in 2020. Mr. Morisani will touch upon in details afterwards, so I'll stop here. So those transactions set a role model for their peers in the industry. We think Financial institutions like us have a role to play to ensure those frameworks and KPIs are clear and comply with the latest bond principles working together with clients. Thank you, Mr. Ito. Back to you. Thank you, Hei san uh, Let's move on to the second round of uh, this panel discussion. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Paga-san of TCFD, one thing uh, everyone seems to want to talk about uh, is possibility that uh, climate-related disclosure may help facilitate fundraising and increase market evaluation. Could you provide us with your vision as a TCFD secretariat? 
Yes, uh, it would be my pleasure. Absolutely, that is the plan, right? Climate-related disclosures have already been a part of how users are making financial decisions, investors, lenders, underwriters. Transition plan should just be that new added component and should really be a part of every financial decision going forward, both because it considers how a company is going to mitigate climate-related risks, but also how it's going to maximize climate-related opportunities. And the idea is that transition plan, including metrics, including targets, including interim targets, and credible action plans is really that input on which we look at the future performance and position of a company. And maybe just for a second, I'll put uh, my other hat on as a climate and sustainability lead at Oliver Wyman, a consulting firm. I've actually been supporting clients, uh, financial institutions in their climate scenario analysis. And they use climate scenario analysis to look at a market evaluation of a company uh, looking forward in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, based on climate. Um, and the way they've been doing it is they do it as an outside in view of how, of how a company is going to evolve. It, they make assumptions of you know, what they're going to do, let's say with their oil and gas assets, how much will they uh, invest into renewables. However, if the companies, the financial institutions actually had information from the, the preparers who said, this is what's going to happen with my assets. This is how much I intend to invest into renewables. This is how much I intend to um, invest uh, dealing with my stranded assets. You know, this is how I'm going to build up my infrastructure to adapt to climate. That would be, this would give the preparers a chance to lead the conversation as well, to share their plans and to actually have a say in how that market evaluation is happening. So. What I'm saying is, in a way, the market evaluations, it, it, at least within a lot of private equity firms and banks and asset managers and uh, asset owners, already incorporate climate scenario analysis in that consideration. Now we're just giving preparers a chance to provide what they believe are the business models and assumptions for the users to have more information to make that informed decision of how a company's financial performance and position is going to evolve going forward. So I'm looking forward to seeing more data being available in the market and that you know, fund procurement and market evaluation to really be based on more credible data. And, and another piece that we've been uh, you know, supporting our clients with is especially that conversation they have with the investors and lenders when they're procuring funds. Uh, because the cost of funds, for example, really varies nowadays based on what your climate outlook is. So banks are already considering how the preferential terms they offer based on your transition plan. So again, it is in, in the company's best interest to work on that discussion, to engage with the financial institutions and explain um, their work on transition plans, their, their thoughts on actions and targets, and have a chance to procure good funds that will support their transitions. For example, such as you know the Transition Finance Initiative that you are all driving, which is just an amazing, amazing initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to ask uh, Park Sun. Uh, ICMA is among the first to establish a framework for transition by issuing the handbook. Could you talk about the background of formulate formulating the transition finance handbook and current transition bond market. Could you yes, also, thank you. sorry, could you also tell Go us ahead. about uh, ICMA's uh, future initiatives for transition bonds? Go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. And, and sorry for jumping the gun a little bit there. Um, yes, it's, about, it's been about um, a year since the release of the Climate Transition Finance Handbook that was published in December 2020. Um, firstly, I'd like to say that we're very honored that the Japanese authorities have used the, you know, the Climate Transition Finance Handbook of ICMA as a key reference for their recommendations regarding transition finance. The handbook is an initiative that was developed with the Executive Committee of the Green and Social Bond Principles in the context of a market environment 
where there was increasing debate about how to integrate more explicitly transition themes in the sustainable bond market in the context of a debate about the need for a so-called transition bond. It remains often misunderstood that, that our answer was not to define transition bonds as a new financial instrument. What we did was to provide guidance on how transition themes could be integrated into existing sustainable finance products, such as green bonds and sustainability linked bonds that I referred to earlier. So to summarize, we did not see transition as a new product, but rather as a strategy and a process that can be substantiated and disclosed by organizations issuing in a sustainable finance market. Now, regarding the, the transition finance market today, in line with our recommendation, there is not a significant market for transitions bonds that labeled as such, but an increasing proportion of sustainable bonds um, have climate transition features. We know, for example, the growing success of sustainability linked bonds where international issuance to date exceeds 80 billion US dollars. This is great progress for a product which guidance was only published 14 months ago. Importantly, by our estimate, 80% of these bonds have climate related targets. However, it is still early days regarding explicit alignment with the CTF handbook as such. Concerning future plans, we are getting a great deal of market feedback on the handbook and we'll be deciding in the coming months with the executive committee of the Green and Social Fund principles whether updates are required. To conclude, and as mentioned earlier, the implementation of the TCFD's transition plan recommendations is likely to be supported by sustainable financial instruments such as sustainable to link bonds. This will create with the existing CTF handbook fertile ground for further positive developments in the transition finance space. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, SNAM is a famous uh, energy infrastructure company and uh, one of the largest capital market. I'm sure SNAM is a pioneer in issuing transition bonds. Molisani san, could you talk about your experience in terms of the difficulties or consequences in issuing transition bonds? And do you see what kind of synergetic effects between disclosure and fundraising? Go ahead, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, as, mentioned, as mentioned before, for a company such as SNAM, having a regulated asset base in excess of 20 billion euro, a gross debt of more than 15 billion euro, and an annual rollover on the debt capital market of something like 2 billion euro per year, Having the possibility to access, to have an easy access to the debt capital market at a reasonable cost is not, let's say, is crucial not to sustain our, our long-term growth plan. This factor, coupled with the acceleration of the transition and decarbonization trends, suggested us in 2018 to access the sustainable finance space. The first step was not on the debt capital market, but was on the banking, on the banking segment when we executed the a 3.2 billion euro TPI linked loan with, that is the forerunner of today SLB bond where there is a bonus malus mechanism where the, the margin steps up or step down depending on the capability of the company to achieve a certain, um, certain environmental target such as the, reduce, the reduction of, of, of methane leakage and the CO2 and the CO2 emission. This was the third largest loan of this type in the world and the first executed by, by a utility. It was scrutinized by more than 20 banks, including Bank of America, including Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. But the next question was how to approach the debt capital market. That remains our key source of funding, represents something like three-fourths of our total debt. At that time, the initial stage of our journey, the obvious answer was a use of proceed based instrument with an independent second party opinion provider and an annual reporting on the progress and impact of our investment and of our action. We genuinely thought at that time that this would have been the best option for a non-pure green company to attract ESG investors, sweeping away any greenwashing potential misperception, 
while betting on the transparency and the possibility to build up a long-lasting relationship with the financial community, building up a track record of credibility in our commitment and delivery capability. So the first move, as mentioned before, was our 0.5 billion euro climate action bond executed in early 2019. This was the second ever of its kind in the world. And uh, we share with the financial community an underlying basket of circa 0.6 billion euro, most of which 60% were represented by carbon and emission reduction projects. So the, the main aim of this investment was two twofold. The first one, reducing the environmental impact of our core business. And secondly, passing the message to the market that gas was already and is already a viable solution to displace coal and diesel in power generation and transport, respectively, thus achieving the first tangible sign of decarbonization. But the most important underlying message we sent to the market is that even a pure, a pure non-pure green company can activate all the levers under its control in order to make its business more environmental friendly. And we believe that every investor should support company embracing the decarbonization challenge, giving them the benefit of the doubt. As Bank of America knows, because they were the structure of this first uh, bond, we met more than 100 investors before the transaction. And in spite of some initial skepticism and reluctance from investors, we were able to print a bond which was three times oversubscribed with a negative new issue premium and one fourth of the book coming from ERG investors. However, taking into account this skepticism, we decided to spend most of our times in the following May on the streets, you know, uh, attending roadshow, video conference, conference in a seamless effort to, let's say, educate to some extent the DCM investors, putting them in the best condition to properly assess our strategy and our action. And I believe that the fruits of this uh, this incredible effort paid off in mid-2020 when we decided to publish a new framework called the Transition Bond Framework and moving the product from Climate Action Bond to Transition Bond. We stress the three main points. The first, the, most, the, the more challenging targets in terms of emission reduction commented before. Secondly, the growing role of green gases, biomethane and hydrogen in particular, and last but not least, the potential of the gas infrastructure to support green gases development, reducing the time to market and improving the economics. In this regard, we share with the financial community a basket of investments of around 2.5 billion euro, most of which were taxonomy compliant investment aimed at replacing and creating new assets with hydrogen, with hydrogen standard. The number speaks for themselves with regard to the success of this, of this bond, because in June 2020, we were the second ever transition bond issuer, and in less than 12 months, we printed 2.3 billion euro of transition bonds, which were typically three to five times oversubscribed, with zero to negative new issue premium, and where the portion of ESG investor reached from the 20% of the first climate action bond to three fourth of our book. And today, our sustainable finance is 60% of the total funding, achieving three years in advance the target shared with the financial community. But I think that number is not everything. I don't want to bother you with all the, let's say, association we are part of, but I think that few key achievements are worth to be stressed. The first one is the work concluded in December 2020 with ICMA. Patrick has already commented on, uh, on this. And the second one is the Environmental Finance Award to SNAM for innovation to its transition framework in April 2021. We continue to produce a tremendous effort in terms of education and interaction with investors because we believe that these efforts of education, standardization, and uh, working together with our uh, corporate investors, banks, rating agency to implement the sustainable finance would pay off in the medium to long term. As a potential next steps, the last 30 seconds of my intervention, but I think that Nicolas offered an incredible bridge to this, to this consideration. As mentioned before, we believe that at the beginning of our journey, the transition bond was the best option for a non-pure 
green uh, company for the reason mentioned before. Today, we believe two new opportunities. The first one is the taxonomy. As mentioned before, 40 to 50% of our investment are taxonomy compliant. So we believe that it's not unrealistic to think about a use of proceeds based taxonomy aligned green bond for companies such as NAM, or on the other hand, uh, following the general corporate purpose space, which is the sustainable linked bond that I've mentioned before, it's the second step of the TPI based loan we executed in 2018, because we believe that today the market is more ready, is more educated, is more used to assess the action and the strategy of non-pure green companies as demonstrated by the success of some recent transaction coming from, just to do some example, ENI or Repsol in the oil and gas, in the oil and gas phases, where in the past, the use of proceeds requirement for this company was not negotiable for investors in the past. So I, we believe in a nutshell that today the market has understood that every company embracing the decarbonization challenge should have the opportunity to find the finance to support this action and should, benefit, should have the benefit of the doubt. Thank you. Uh, hi, San. Uh, as you said earlier, SNAM is your company's client. So uh, there are many, many things to talk about SNAM, but I'd like to ask you a different question. You have been involved in developing uh, Japan's basic principle for transition finance, uh, transition finance no tameno kihon shishi, at the task force where I chair. How do you expect the future of transition finance in Japan as well as abroad? And how do you see the development of so-called roadmap as well as the creation of model project that the National Sun of Medi referred to in his pre presentation? Go ahead, please. Thank you. <clears throat> as I said, transition finance is essential for Japanese corporates because there are many industries which are heavily reliant on fossil fuel and they need to be decarbonized. Um, as Mr. Nasuno mentioned, that, uh, there are a lot of interest in the industry, not only corporate, but also financial industries. And then through the process of preparing a uh, Kihon Shishi no a climate finance transition, climate transition finance handbook, uh, guideline, basic guidelines, sorry, but uh, that handbook, we have been getting a lot of inquiries from issuer clients, potential issuers, and then also, as well as investor clients uh, on transition finance. I have been asked so many questions, what's the difference between transition finance, transition bond, green bond, and so on, and then they are so interested. And then also, how issuer can describe their transition pathway uh, to decarbonization and so on. We may need more time to see more issuers or uh, for, to see more issuers and investors in this space to participate in, but I'm sure that the market is going to grow further. When we see more best-in-class uh, presidents such as SNAM or some other Japanese corporates already, uh, then uh, we will see uh, more issuers and more investors to be involved. And then also the roadmaps or model uh, project that will help uh, Japanese issuers and investors to understand further what transition finance is. So, and then also uh, TCFD transition uh, on October 14th will be also a great help. Thank you. Thank you, Heisa. Uh, san uh, your company, Idemitsu, is, of course, in the energy sector. Uh, it's needless to say your company has been tackling the challenges of energy transformation, as you said earlier. So could you tell us about your company transition plan and financing in the near future? Hi. え、
I feel so grateful that I can uh, participate in this uh, TCFD 2021. I would like to explain a little bit about our company. In order to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, we have set our vision for 2030 as a responsible change agent and feel, will fulfill our responsibility to protect the Earth and people's lives by promoting the energy material transition to a carbon neutral and recycling oriented society through our business activities. For example, um, uh, as a part of the uh, energy sector, I'd like to share our uh, plan. So, uh, First of all, uh, we would like to uh, take up the challenge of this issuer together with the portfolio transformation. The next one is about as uh, the uh, petroleum uh, company, make sure that we can make use of the uh, uh, storage and we can turn it into the carbon neutral uh, plants. And we call that carbon neutral transformation center as an advanced neutral factories. And uh, in a country like Japan, which is prone to natural disasters, uh, we are planning to uh, evolve our 6,300 service stations across the country as important infrastructure to support the uh, local economy and people's lives. That's our plan. So, we would like to make use of transition finance for the social implementation of these plans. We recognize that uh, transition finance is an important means of financing the realization of a series of strategies, and uh, we are currently examining it with a great interest. Thank you. Thank you. Next. And maybe your final question to Terakami san. It's okay. <laughs> when it comes to the relation between. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was relaxed. I didn't realize that the, I will receive a next question. When it comes to the relation between the corporate governance process and decarbonization. Could you tell us about your, your company's uh, governance process or structure at your company toward to uh, carbon neutrality? Could you talk about uh, corporate governance in terms of uh, transition finance? Hi. Hey, to 2030 visions and also to achieve the carbon neutrals, that uh, we have uh, uh, several uh, very special um, departments such as sustainability, uh, strategic uh, uh, department, and also CNX, carbon neutral transformation uh, strategic department. And also I mentioned about the local economy. Uh, this is the uh, revitalization of the local economy and also the uh, uh, we have a DTK promotion department, uh, digital transformation. We have established these different new departments so that uh, we can achieve the uh, transition plan. And after that, as for each different project, um, we have a management uh, committee and a member of the management committee can discuss on these different projects and the result will be approved by the board. And after that, um, periodically, they conduct the monitoring uh, uh, meetings so that uh, we can make sure that the, uh, we see the progress and also share everyone uh, with the uh, goal of this carbon neutrality in the future. That's the uh, organization that we have. I'm afraid uh, time is up. So uh, finally, let me wrap up this panel discussion. 
Uh, of course, we enjoy today's discussion pretty much in terms of the relationship between uh, TCFD disclosure and transition finance. The bottom line is that uh, transition finance is indispensable to carbon neutrality. And to do it in a successful manner, we should be more informed with TCFD disclosure. I'm sure we got deeper insight into how and how to implement to accelerate virtuous cycle between uh, the pathway to carbon neutrality and transition finance through enhanced climate-related disclosure based upon TCFD. I'd like to say thank you to all the panelists. I appreciate your contributions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ito and the panelists. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much. Now, after thank you for having us. Three minutes break, keynote four and the panel discussion four will start. Participants online, please go back to the timeline and join the next session, keynote four and the panel discussion four. The keynote four will now commence. Mr. Takashima Makoto, Chairman of Japanese Bankers Association and President and CEO of Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corporation will give a speech. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Makoto Takashima. I am Chairman of the Japanese Bankers Association and President and CEO of SMBC. I am delighted to have this opportunity to speak to you today. 
In the two years since the first TCFP summit in October 2019, it is clear that global momentum towards the achievement of a net zero world has accelerated considerably. This is reflected both in the growing importance, sophistication, and expectations of climate-related disclosures. Since its establishment two years ago, the TCFP Consortium has made a major contribution to the progress of climate-related disclosures. Reflecting this, over the same period, the number of Japanese companies declaring their support for TCFD have doubled, making it the largest single nation contingent in the world. By way of example, if I may say a word about my own bank, SNBC is making progress on developing its TCFD-related disclosures since its announcement of support in 2017. In our latest TCFD report uh, published this summer, we committed to achieving net zero in our financed emissions by 2050. In addition, we also disclose the results of our fiscal risk analysis now on a global basis and our transition risk analysis are based on the NGFS net zero 2050 scenario. Furthermore, under our roadmap addressing climate change published this year, we are accelerating the introduction of practical measures, such as calculating our financed emissions and setting targets for their reduction. We all know that the achievement of a carbon neutral world is going to be a huge task. The economy and society need to make major structural changes. But the realization of carbon neutrality is already a global issue that nobody can avoid. Speaking on behalf of the Japanese banking industry, I'd like to express our determination to continue pursuing transition toward a decarbonized society. But the key point here is that our aim is to do this, not simply by divesting from certain businesses or sectors, but rather by active engagement with customers in order to encourage our support of their transition. Our customers making their own disclosures in line with the CFD recommendations is the foundation of such engagement. By understanding their detailed plans for transition, KPIs and the emissions targets, and building a shared understanding of what transition involves, banks can contribute by engaging effectively with their customers to assist with their transition. This will require access to relevant information, such as customers' transition strategies and emissions data, which is proposed to be included in the TCFD recommendations. We see climate-related information becoming as important as financial information, and therefore, we will continue to encourage our customers to enhance their disclosures in line with the TCFD recommendations. Again, the realization of carbon neutrality is going to be a real challenge, but at the same time, it is essential to achieve sustainable growth throughout the whole economy and society through the process of transformation towards a carbon neutral state. This is what Prime Minister of Japan recently put forth as the government's vision for a virtuous cycle between the economy and the environment as a key pillar of Japan's future growth strategy. The forthcoming G20 summit and the COP26 may mark a major turning point in how the world addresses the question of climate change. I have no hesitation in saying that the Japanese banking industry will make this year a starting point for accelerating its measures to support our customers' efforts towards achieving a decarbonized society, anticipating and preparing to meet the challenge to come. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you a successful outcome for this TCFD summit. Thank you. Now we would like to move on to panel discussion four, TCFD disclosures in Trans-Pacific region. The facilitator of this session is Mr. Fujimura Takehira. 
General Manager of Corporate Sustainability and CSR Department at Mitsubishi Corporation. Now I'd like to pass the facilitation to Mr. Fujimura. Mr. Fujimura, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, panel discussion for uh, TCFD disclosures in Trans-Pacific region. Let me start the session by introducing uh, the great panel today. Uh, from my side, um, Ms. Victoria Tan, Executive Director, Head of Group Risk Management and Sustainability Unit at Ayala Corporation, the largest conglomerate in the Philippines. Ms. Tan is joining us uh, through online. Mr. Toshiaki Tanaka, member of the board, senior management, managing executive officer, chief environment and sustainability officer, Mitsui OSK Lines, one of the greatest shipping companies in Japan. Ms. Yuranda Chan, head of sustainability institutional banking group at DBS Bank, the Singapore most reputable leading bank. Ms. Chan is joining us today through online. Mr. Koichiro Oshima, Managing Executive Officer, Head of Financial Solutions Group, MUFG Bank, one of the greatest mega banks in Japan. And by the way, I'm Takehiro Fujimura. I'm a General Manager of Corporate Sustainability and CSR Department, Mitsubishi Corporation. I'm a member of TCFD. As such, uh, I, was, I have been given this great opportunity to be a facilitator of this great panel. The goal of this uh, session is to see the need and the progress of climate-related disclosures in Trans-Pacific region and to see the challenges to further enhance the disclosures in the region and to see if there is any contribution which Japan could make and the Asia, uh, for, for other Asian or trans-Pacific countries to encourage the disclosure. And here's how this panel discussion would work. First, I will go through the, some introductory slides, very briefly, showing some factual background for the discussion. And then I'd like you to watch the video message from Mr. Juan Carlos Berastejicoitia, chairman of TCFD Consortium in Japan, in Mexico. And after that, I ask the panel to go into the discussion. Now I'd like to explain, explain some introductory slides very briefly. I do not want to spend much time on this so that I, we can spend more time on the discussion. Please look at the first slide. The left-hand chart describes the volume of global GHG emissions by region. You can see decarbonization in Asia is essential to tackle global climate change. The right-hand chart describes the growth of green finance market in ASEAN countries. You can see the rapid development of sustainable finance in ASEAN countries. The second slide would show you the number of TCFD supporters by region and the recent regulatory development of climate change disclosures in Asia. We can see there is a room to further enhance the disclosures in Asia. And there may be a need for assistance or support for Asian companies to implement the climate-related disclosure. Third slide explains TCFD Consortium in Japan. TCFD Consortium was established in May 2019 by a joint effort between private sector and governmental agencies to enhance TCFD disclosures by Japanese companies. And we believe this is one of the key success factors in dramatically increasing the number of TCFD supporters as well as the disclosures. The governmental support includes practical guide for scenario analysis issued by Ministry of the Environment as described in this page. The last slide is Mitsui OSK Line's transition loan project, a great example of company procuring finance 
for its transition project by having proper climate-related disclosures in place. I expect that uh, Mr. Tanaka of today's panel will share his experience in this great project in our discussion. Now I'd like you to watch the video message from Mr. Juan Carlos Velasquez Goitia, chairman of the recently uh, formed uh, Mexican TCFD consortium. Here is some background. Mr. Nagamura, uh, TCFD member and a member of the Japan's TCFD consortium planning committee, introduced how Japanese private sector and the government sector worked together to promote TCFD disclosures in Japan at the APEC finance ministers meeting. The Bank of Mexico showed strong interest in such activities. After some further introduction to Mexico from the three Japanese governmental agency, METI, FSA, and MOE, and Japanese consortium, the Mexican TCFD consortium has been established. This is, we believe, a great example of cooperation in Trans-Pacific region. With that, please watch the message. Dear colleagues, my name is Juan Carlos Velosti Goitia, chair of the recently created Mexican TCFD consortium. Let me start by thanking the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry of the Government of Japan for its kind invitation to deliver this message at the TCFD summit. Mexico faces considerable physical risks due to climate change for its geographical position in the southern part of the northern hemisphere between two oceans. All reasonable climate change scenarios for our country project increases in the frequency and intensity of hot weather extremes, heavy precipitation, severe droughts, and more intense hurricanes. All of it could have immense economic, social, and environmental implications. At the same time, Mexico has a very open economy with a buoyant export sector. The timely transition to a low carbon economy and adapting to climate change are enormous challenges that will require a considerable reallocation of financial flows among sectors and regions. This process entails significant risks and opportunities for the Mexican financial sector. These challenges have prompted the country's financial institutions, both public and private, to take important actions, including one, actively participating in international fora, for example, in 2014, the Mexican U20 presidency led to the establishment of a climate finance study group within the U20, planting the seed of what later became the Green Finance Study Group and the Sustainable Finance Study Group. As a founding member of the NGFS, Banco de Mexico has been actively promoting the adoption of methodologies that allow the incorporation of climate and ESG risks and opportunities. Two, developing and implementing of policies and regulations, such as the mandatory requirement for pension funds to explain how they incorporate ESG provisions in their financial decisions. Three, strengthening sectoral governance. At the heart of the Government of Mexico governance of the Sustainable Finance Agenda is the recently created Sustainable Finance Committee. In June 2020, the Council for the Stability of the Financial System approved the creation of this committee to delve into the topic of sustainable development and its implications for the stability of the Mexican financial system. Four, developing and applying tools and resources. Since 2016, both public and private Mexican financial stakeholders have launched several tools and resources, including protocols and guidelines, such as the sustainability protocol launched by the Mexican Banking Association. In 2016, in 2017, a group of financial institutions developed a drought stress testing tool that assesses how the incorporation of different drought scenarios changes the risk in loan portfolio. Five, adhering to international principles. Several financial institutions are signatories of the equator principles, the principles for responsible banking, the principles for responsible investment, and the task force on climate-related financial disclosures, among many other initiatives. Six, developing and, impl and implementing initiatives in capital markets. In 2011, the Mexican Stock Exchange launched its first sustainability index, and in 2014, it joined the UN Sustainable Stock Exchanges initiatives. All these actions show the commitment of the Mexican financial authorities and the private sector to promote sustainable finance and the willingness of financial agents in general to incorporate climate change-related considerations into the decision-making and operational processes. 
Despite all the progress, there are still important gaps that prevent an efficient and effective development of sustainable finance in Mexico. The group that conceived the Mexican PCFD consortium identified the following key gaps as the ones to be addressed by the consortium. One, the need of domestic platforms that could facilitate efficient capacity building and implementation efforts. Two, the need to develop competencies and homogeneous approaches among trainers and consultants supporting preparers in the region. And three, the need of a platform where corporate players could discuss challenges, approaches, experiences, and best practices with their peers, and where investors and corporates could have a dialogue to understand users' expectations and climate relation information needs. The support of the government of Japan has been instrumental for the creation of the Mexican TCFD consortium. In 2019, at an APEX senior officials meeting, one of the creators of the Mexican TCFD consortium attended a panel discussion in which Mr. Masaharu Makino of the Japanese Ministry of Finance discussed the implementation of the TCFD in his country. Another opportunity to learn about the Japanese experience took place later that year when Mr. Masaaki Nagamura, who is a member of the TCFD and the steering committee member of the Japanese consortium, made a presentation on the Japanese consortium in a seminar on ESG factors in financial markets at an APEC finance minister's meeting. The creators of the Mexican consortium concluded that the Japanese model could be adapted to Mexico to address the key gaps that they have identified. The Japanese government has supported us not only by providing a model, but also by providing guidance and information that help us draft the governance and consortium's bylaws. We are looking forward to continuing this very close cooperation. What is the Mexican TC FD consortium goal, what are, where are we now and what are the, our next steps? Our goal is to increase disclosure of financial and material ESG risks in Mexico, starting with climate risks following the recommendation, recommendations of the TCFD. We have finished the design of the consortium and we have produced bylaws and selected the consortium's chair and secretariat members. Last week, we convened a working group that will approve the formal operation of the consortium define its strategic lines and plan key activities. We will present the consortium officially in late October or early November, and we will have our first training courses shortly after. With regard to our regional scope, in the beginning, we will focus our activities on Mexico, but in order to learn and discuss best international practices and promote public-private collaboration among jurisdictions, we eventually plan to contribute to the creation and strengthening of consortia in other countries, especially in Latin America. Finally, let me state that we are completely committed to promoting TCFD goals and recommendations and that we look forward to collaborating with similar organizations to ensure that companies and investors understanding of the financial implications associated with climate change will grow, empowering the markets to channel investment to sustainable and resilient solutions, opportunities, and business models. Thank you very much. Okay, now let's get into the discussion. Uh, Ayala Corporation and Mitsui OSK Lines are both leading companies in terms of climate-related disclosures. I'd like to start the discussion by asking Ms. Tang and Mr. Tanaka about their exper experience, especially the benefit for their companies in implementing TCFD disclosures. Ms. Tang? Hi. Uh Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me. As mentioned previously, I'm Victoria Tan. I'm the Executive Director for Group Risk Management and Sustainability at Ayala Corporation, probably one of the largest and most diversified business conglomerates in the Philippines with interest in real estate, banking, telecommunications, and power also a growing presence in healthcare and uh, logistics. Also investment in water, mobility, infrastructure, education, and disruptive technologies. Just to give you a sense of how big the group is and how it is challenging for us to do the TCFD adoption. But beside those challenges, we committed to adopt the TCFD framework precisely because beyond compliance, we see 
that the TCMP framework is an outside in framework that will help us understand the impact of climate change to our businesses and how are we going to put that or embed that in our strategy and financial planning process as mentioned by the previous speaker. So this will be a good framework for us to uh, build resilience and to future proof the organization. Aside from that, I also believe that the framework will guide our innovations and our strategies. It will help us address the risk and uh, explore opportunities. And I think at this point, we want to attract investors because we need, it. We need that green financing to finance our climate-related initiatives, especially in nature based solutions. I also believe that the TCFD framework will enhance our brand and will make us more engaged with other stakeholders. We kept hearing that climate change requires a whole of society approach. So it would be beneficial for the government, for the corporates and other actors to actually adapt this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tam. Uh, so, Ms. Mr. Tanaka. Hi. Uh, this is Tanaka from Mitsuyoshi Airlines. Uh, who we are? We are a shipping company and uh, operating uh, 800 ships over the world. And uh, we are emitting uh, 150, uh, sorry, 15 million CO2 per year. It's a very large number, large quantity. And since the Kyoto Protocol was agreed, we realized that uh, the, to reduce CO2 is a very significant uh, issue for our company. And of then after the Paris Agreement, uh, we, we, as a management, decided to uh, plan uh, to reduce the CO2 emission. Uh, we adopted, we announced that kind of a vision, uh, but uh, that was not enough. And uh, at the same time, we realized that uh, we need to analyze the uh, world economy and the industry's uh, movement. They are also struggling with uh, to reduce CO2 emission. We need to analyze the scenario, uh, so-called uh, opportunities and risks. And uh, we can do it by ourselves. But uh, we observed that uh, TCFD is a very, very good uh, uh, framework uh, for not only the, by ourselves, uh, organic analysis, but if we use this framework and to appeal to the uh, public. And uh, that is a very good idea we adopted. And uh, this year, we upgraded our environmental vision and uh, we disclosed, we announced that we uh, have showed a roadmap until 2050 uh, where we are emitting zero emission. And in order for us to do, achieve this project, we need to uh, find good uh, finance service, financial services, and uh, not only for demonstrate value of MOL to the ESG uh, rating. Uh, we need, we are this, as a listed, listed company, uh, we need to show ourselves a good position. Not only to, for that, but also really we need to draw the fine, good finance. So if for that, the TCFD is very, very good framework. It's of course supported by government and the, the program is very well, uh, good, good, well recognized. And uh, that's, we are, uh, that is the reason why we adopted the TCFD so seriously. And uh, as a result, now we are, uh, later I will explain that we got the uh, transition wrong, for, exa for example. So that is a good reason for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Of course, TCFD disclosures for investors but it is very interesting to see that um, the disclosures uh, will give the company itself the benefit, such as uh, better risk management, 
um, the, uh, building business resilience, and of course, uh, the financing its carbon decarbonization project. Although we have leading examples such as uh, MOL or IARA, uh, the data suggests that the disclosures in Asia are not sufficiently advanced. I now would like to ask Ms. Chang and Mr. Oshima about the views of financial institutions. How do you see the climate-related disclosures in Asia? Especially what kinds of challenges uh, are there? Ms. Chang? Thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you our views and the recommendations that we have learned the hard way at DBS. With TCFD, we are the first Singaporean financial institution to adopt such recommendations for our reporting. We have been doing that for three years. The way that my team is organized at DBS is actually symbolic and mirroring the TCFD purposes, looking at both risks and opportunities. My team is responsible for conducting the environmental social governance due diligence, but at the same time also identifying solutions and providing advisory to companies how they can make a transition into more resource efficient and lower carbon operations. We do see the convergence of risks and opportunities coming together. This is symbolic of our view how to approach TCFD. It is not only for compliance purposes, it is not only for reputational uh, purposes, is not only for branding and PR, it is something that will inform our strategy, our customers' strategies. They will be able to pinpoint areas where they can mitigate and adapt to climate change impacts. So I would really recommend many of the companies in attendance who are still considering TCFD adoption to really approach it with both lenses, risks and opportunities. When it comes to the challenges of reporting against TCFD for our financial institution, the main one is that we, the bulk of our emissions profile comes from our customers' emissions, the scope-free emissions. And if our customers' emissions disclosure is found lacking, the banks would have to make all sorts of imprecise assumptions and use of proxies to estimate their emissions, which is not ideal for risk management. So as a start, at DBS, we are now encouraging the customers that we do business with to start measuring their greenhouse gas emissions. And sometimes this will be included as a condition of financing. We have also structured many sustainability link transition type financing, whereby we incentivize customers who start measuring the emissions, setting reduction targets uh, by reducing the interest margin on, on the loans. So I hope that with financial institutions playing our part, providing the incentives, more and more companies in Asia will be able to adopt better disclosure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Oshima, please. Thank you. Um, so uh, my, my name is Koichiro Oshima. Uh, I oversee various lending products at the MUFG as head of the solutions. Uh, including um, various sustainable financing efforts. Um, at MUFG, we signed up for TCFD in 2017, and um, since then, you know, as, as the world has developed, um, we have um, introduced ideas such as MUFG environmental and social policies or certain target goals uh, for uh, carbon emissions. Also, this year, we have declared carbon neutrality by 2050, uh, probably be the first bank to do so in Japan this year. Now, together with all these efforts, we have been um, uh, improving our disclosure along the guidance uh, from TCFD, and then this has been a great help for us, because I, I think, you know, in order to explain our efforts, this is a good platform uh, with the unanimous, uh, with the uh, constant uh, reporting style that um, everybody, it makes everybody easy to understand your efforts. Um, as for uh, the situation of reporting in uh, Asia, uh, I'd like to say that, you know, in Japan, a lot of companies have signed up for TCFD uh, 
thanks to the effort made by uh, Japan Consortium. But in Asia, I think the situation differs from country to country, company to company. Um, the, the understanding of uh, re reporting is still different. And um, as the importance for ESG and carbon neutrality you know, develops uh, stronger day by day, I, I think um, the importance has to be recognized by these companies as well. Um, for, for financial institutions like ourselves, it is important to, uh, you know, the first step looking at TCFD disclosure is the first step in analyzing whether a certain company has its strategies, uh, you know, uh, aligned with certain uh, goals such as the Paris Agreement or certain uh, national determined uh, goals. So um, for us, you know, it, our hope is that a lot of companies will, you know, um, take up TCFD uh, for their disclosures going forward, which makes it easier for us to, you know, anal analyze these kind of um, uh, situations. Um, for us, in Asia especially, um, with um, transition being more difficult, probably compared to like Europe and Americas. Um, we, we believe that um, transition steps are important and in order to analyze and understand that direction, I think reporting becomes key in that transition uh, evaluation process. Thank you. Thank you very much. It seems like um, in emerging markets uh, like Asia, a uh, company faces more difficulties to decarbonize its business. And decarbonization in Asia cannot be achieved quickly uh, compared with other regions such as Europe. So transition is more important in Asia than it is in Europe. And finance for such transition is critical in Asia. Ms. Tang, from your viewpoint, what are the difficulties or challenges for, a, for climate related disclosures? And also, we touched on the transition. Please share with us uh, IRA's transition strategy. Um, thank you, Mr. Tang. Before our local SEC issued the regulation for publicly listed companies to start disclosing their non financial performance, in 2019, the private sector had a series of dialogues and consultations with them and other intermediaries. During that dialogue, these are the challenges that almost all reporting companies mentioned, and I think they are still true to this day. The first one is it will require time and resources. So the SEC has actually given most publicly listed companies at least four years to make sure that they will be able to, to adapt TCFD fully well. And that will be from 2019 to 2022. During this time, we can just say to comply or we can explain. After that, everything will be mandatory. The things that they have mentioned is, I think also mentioned by our speaker from Mexico, is the lacking of capability and skill. First of all, in identifying gases in accordance with the Kyoto Protocol. We are more familiar with carbon, but there are still other gases that contribute to the GHG emissions that we have right now. 20% of that is coming from methane, 60% from carbon. The other 20% is actually coming from other gases. We need someone or we need a capability to analyze this data to report and monitor the data. Ms. Chung actually mentioned about the complex scope three, and I think that is also a similar situation that we are facing. That is very complex because that is also called the value chain emission, and that may require extrapolation or proxies for us to make sure that we at least have a sense of how much is our scope three emission. We also have a bank in the portfolio, and I'm sure that is the same fear that they have. Another thing is in terms of tools. So for the financial data, we have ERP platform. 
for the non-financial data, we have Excel. If that is good enough, probably it's not because we want to make sure that our data is complete and at least accurate and reasonable. Another tool probably is in developing scenario analysis and climate modeling. I heard that Japan and even Mexico said that they have developed something similar to address the issue on, on climate modeling and scenario planning. I hope we can have something in the Philippines. Another one is we need to grow the pool of external assurers because right now the report that we are issuing is being used by investors. So we have just to make sure that what we are putting out there are if they're externally assured or audited. That will actually give every one of us confidence and comfort that what we are giving you, uh, the investors, the lenders, and even the insurers are really uh, empirical data and there are evidences to support it. I heard it, I heard it from the other uh, speaker. Uh, he said that there could be some difficult uh, differences in interpretation. So probably there is a need also to have a common language. Internally, I think what we need to get from our management is that by you, because TCFD is really a massive task. And I think we need to create alleys or form network to make sure that we will be reporting on the 11 recommended disclosures. I think the second question is in relation to our transition plan. Um, we are doing something about it, and I hope that we will be uh, announcing it soon enough for the investor community, but definitely our transition plan will be guided by the TCFD framework. In brief, our approach to our climate ambition, which is to transition in a low carbon or even net zero economy, will be through a building block approach. And we have identified five focus areas. We have to measure our footprints and understand the risk. We have to do target setting and create roadmaps for each different group. But we can have a unified target of committing to net zero. Reduction strategy, that is something that we are looking at within the group, such as off-site RE, on-site RE, energy efficiency measures, and others. But the most important part is on the investment strategy. And there, in this particular strategy, we need the green financing mechanism to help us finance carbon-related initiatives, such as battery storage, or nature-based solutions, among others. And along the way, we need to have continuous communication and engagement with our stakeholders. I think that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Tam. Um, and we really appreciate uh, Ms. Tam uh, explaining IRA's strategy uh, of transition and I think the details of uh, the, that strategy will, will be announced later. But anyway, I think the transition is necessary for most of Asian companies, and I'm sure that many of them need finance for such transition activities. Mr. Tanaka, uh, your company recently procured transition loan. Please share with us your experience in procuring such loan. Okay, um, but first, uh, can I see the slide? Okay, this one. So let me explain briefly about the project. Uh, the, we are Mitsubishi Airlines, and the, we do uh, four p pillar, p pillars of a business segment. One is a dry bulk transportation, uh, energy transportation, and product. It's uh, like a container ships and others and uh, an associated business. And uh, uh, the, this project is uh, to build uh, two new ferry boat, ferry ships, which are engaged in domestic business. And the, the borrower, uh, myself, and the evaluation, we uh, asked the JCR, Japan Credit Rating Agency, uh, as a, a third party uh, approval. And the arrangers is a, a Japanese bank, 
uh, Developed Bank of Japan and Osumito Mitsui Trust Bank. And the, the ships manufacturer is Japanese shipyard. This and transit strategy, as uh, appreciated by this transition loan, the under part four or strategies we have adopt, adoptation of a clean alternative fuels for shipping company to change fuels is a real, real solution. And also the technology, enhancement of energy saving technology, uh, we are trying to upgrade using such as uh, wind uh, uh, sail uh, for uh, saving the uh, energy, including, including CO2. And the, the building Venus models to enable net zero GHG emissions. Uh, this is that uh, we are trying to involve in, be involved in the, uh, the rule making. And also we are uh, proactively uh, attending to the kind of uh, uh, coalition, uh, international coalitions, uh, and to uh, exchange uh, views of, uh, for reducing the GHG. And the last one uh, is expanding the low carbon and decarbonization projects to the, as a real business. The model group has concentrated strengths uh, such as uh, uh, we are doing logistics uh, business, and which is uh, providing the good supply chain to everybody. So this is a brief uh, introduction of the project. And uh, okay, then let me explain about uh, the transition loan. I try. We 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 as we I explained uh, before. Uh, first part of my, my speech, well, we established the environmental vision uh, where we committed to reduce uh, greenhouse gas down to net zero until 2050. And uh, we have decided to build the first energy fuel domestic ferry in Japan. Ferry, sorry, LNG is not net zero fuel emission. However, at this moment, at this stage, uh, the only this uh, to reduce uh, CO2 directly and immediately is to use uh, energy as fuel. And uh, this is first case uh, in Japan to build a ferry because we don't have any supply chain of energy in Japan, maybe some people are uh, surprising because in Japan is importing a lot of en energy for utility uh, plant. However, as fuel for transportation, there is no good supply chain. So this is very challenging. But uh, as I explained, uh, we have strong strategy for reduce, reducing uh, GHG and uh, we, uh, not, we should challenge this one. And uh, also, we, as everybody knows, uh, in order for to get uh, transition loan, uh, there are uh, uh, some uh, code for for a couple of uh, regulation the rules, uh, which are such as a strategic matter and the also science based. Uh, uh, target we need to show, and also as a materiality, we need to show the uh, real business plan. But, and that's all these issues are uh, approved and recognized. And the, to our goodness, uh, finally, we have succeed, suc uh, su successfully get the finance. And also condition of these loans are rather good. Uh, securing the competitive financial condition for building this energy ferry. Uh, other than applying standard loan. So this is uh, one of the maybe model case for other, other, other stakeholders. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It is very interesting to hear that the, the financial conditions MOL has obtained is more competitive than those in standard loans. It's very interesting.
Now, I, I understand Miss Tan uh, must live in uh, seven or five minutes or so, uh, because the subject is transition. So I would like to ask the uh, transition financial policies uh, to Miss Chang and Mr. Oshima. But before that, uh, you know, uh, Miss Tang is uh, is leaving. Uh, I'd like to ask Miss Tang uh, this question. Um, you know, um, there are audience today uh, who knows that climate related disclosure is very important, and that TCFD is a good framework and it's a global standard. So they have to do it. But uh, uh, climate related financial disclosures or climate related disclosures is something new to corporate world. So uh, it is very difficult for a company to, to commence the activities for the disclosures. And if uh, you have any advice for beginners of disclosures or if you have any comment on those situations, please give us. Ms. Tan. Okay, thank you for that. I think we have been on the same similar uh, joint. The first thing that I did was I familiarized myself with the TCFD framework. They have a very good website, and that website actually contains a lot of information. They even have a good practice handbook, and we are actually using that as a reference when we do our disclosures. What we did earlier on is really to ask someone like Deloitte to do a gap analysis, look into our disclosures and see whether, where we can improve and how we can improve it along those lines. TCFD has four pillars, uh, governance, strategy, risk management, and um, metrics and targets. Among these four pillars, they have 11 recommended disclosures. So you can check which one is the low-hanging fruit and pursue it. Understand what are the requirements and see how you can operationalize that within your organization. And then when you have this knowledge with you, you have to share it with others. First of all, you have to share that with your senior management team. You need their commitment or their buy-in. You need their, their support. This is really a massive work, and it needs to have that tone from the top approach, and then it will go down to the different business units so that all the information that you will need, the scope one, scope two, scope three, these information are can be found in the different operations. With that support from the senior management team, I'm sure that you can have allies and you can build the network internally. Then you have to ask other um, TCFD supporters or other reporters, how, how about their journey? So you can also pick some tips on how are you going to apply that in your own journey. And the last one that I realized along the way, because there are two uh, pillars there that I really do not have any expertise. You need to engage the expert. And that is along the lines of scenario planning, climate modeling, in setting our metrics and our targets to reach that um, net zero commitment uh, by 2050. So I think the first thing is you have to make sure that you understand the TCFD framework. You have that Build, you have to build the credibility, then talk to your senior management team and explain to them the benefits of doing so. Take out the compliance uh, box. I think that one is very easy and they will just say it's just for compliance. What we need to communicate is the, 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 the need to future-proof the organization and to build that resilience. Communicate every now and then or communicate more regularly and consistently along the requirements of people. I think that is what I can share at this moment. If also, if I may add, um, I'm, I'm really uh, amazed how the Japan TCFD Consortium was brought about or was developed or was organized. I think it is 
brilliant. I believe this explains uh, the surge in the commitment among Japanese companies. You see in the chart uh, earlier, we have that the first line was about 400 plus uh, TCFD supporters. These are all from Japan. And that is amazing, whereas in the Philippines, we only have 13 supporters of TCFD, and half of that is actually from our group, from the IANA group. So 50% of the uh, supporters of the Philippines is from the IANA group. I guess what is amazing is that the consortium brings together institutional investors, financial institutions, and business corporations to promote constructive dialogue around climate-related financial disclosures. And I think this channel, the fund to finance um, strategic action and industrial innovations for a low and zero carbon economy. Here, Mexico has followed your Japanese model, and I hope that the same initiative will be undertaken by our respective uh, government agencies. With financial backing, I guess all companies will be able to come up with their own climate transition plans. Thank you so much for having me today. And I'm so sorry that I have to leave for another invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Tam. Uh, I, know, I know you have to leave, so please be. Thank you very much uh, you. for your you know, insight and comments. So let, let me go back to the uh, subject to, of, the, of the transition. Um, given the transition finance in Asia is very important, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Chang and uh, Mr. Oshima uh, about your financing policy and engagement activities for transition finance. Ms. Chang? I completely agree that transition in Asia is more important compared to the more developed markets in Europe or North America. That's because of the stage of economic development that we're in and also whether the alternatives, the greener solutions are commercially available and affordable at this point. Knowing that transition is very important, we came out with a transition finance framework and taxonomy last year. We are the first commercial bank in the world to do so, and uh, we are very proud to say that for a Southeast Asian bank, DBS has been able to do that first and foremost to set an example. With, with transition finance, using the example that Mitsui OSK MOL, the transition loan as an example, is a very good demonstration how to do transition loans correctly, because we do not want to run the risk of showing transition loan or bond as being inferior of doing green bond or green loan. In fact, when transition is credible, you can demonstrate this is just the beginning or the connection to the pivot and the transformation of the business operations that it is in. When you talk about transition, you also need to talk about the end point, the destination. What would be the end goal the strategic vision of the company. Is it to be aligned with the Paris Agreement or to be net zero by 2050 or any time on the time horizon? When we do and structure transition finance transactions, we look at a number of things to inform our structuring. The first, we will look at the customer's historical performance in their greenhouse gas emissions. Second, we will look at whether they are performing in line with what their industry peers are doing. Are they more advanced or are they lagging behind? Does it represent less room for improvement or more room for improvement? The first thing that we look at is whether that reduction target can be mapped to a science-based pathway. There's no point making only marginal reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and claim that you are doing transition. The reduction needs to be measurable and meaningful. And with all these data points coming into play, we would structure a credible transition loan for our customers, which also act as an advisory to their strategic direction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Oshima. Um, thank you. Um, so, so in a way, I'll be repeating some of um, what Ms. Chan just said about transition, rephrasing a little bit. Um, in Asian countries, the carbon footprint status varies from company to company, country to country. 
So the assumption is that the pathway towards uh, carbon neutrality will significantly differ as well, uh, depending on who you are, where you are. For this reason, it is important for financial institutions like ourselves to carry out um, engagement with clients, trying to understand their current status and uh, the, their intended pathway towards transition. Yet, um, as of today, our understanding is that there is no clear global consensus uh, in terms of or detailed guideline on what exactly constitutes a transition or what can be defined as transition finance. Um, although there are many attempts, as uh, Ms. Ms. Chang just explained, um, from certain um, financial institutions, um, still I think you know that, that we are in a development stage in terms of a uniform uh, standard. In order to clarify some of the ambiguity, um, in or in order to try bridge some of the gaps that exist between different taxonomies or guidelines. With the support from the Japanese government, we have just started a discussions forming a group named Asia Transition Finance Study Group to establish a framework together with major banks from APAC, EMEA, and Americas. Through this effort, we hope to find a pathway uh, for some of the Asian companies that are willing to uh, transition into a low carbon um, uh, footprint but are hesitant due to the ambiguity surrounding uh, the uh, pathway. We hope to you know, uh, get involved with not just our clients, but also various uh, stakeholders, including shareholders and certain governmental entities that will be uh, very supportive of this effort. By listening to the opinions of these stakeholders and utilizing the knowledge of the global community, we would like to continue discussing how to promote carbon neutrality among customers and how to support their transition. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we want to get more uh, insights or comment from this great panel, but uh, due to my poor facilitation, uh, we don't have a, a time anymore. Um, I think the findings from today's discussion is uh, for global of net to zero, global goal of net to zero, uh, decarbonization in Asia and Trans-Pacific is essential. But as this region has more emerging markets, rapid decarbonization is unrealistic, and more practical transition is critical in this region. To enhance this transition, of course, finance plays an important role. Finance, or better finance, uh, can be obtained by proper disclosures. Therefore, the climate-related disclosures in this region is more important than other regions. To enhance the disclosure, uh, Japanese way, uh, meaning joint work between private and government sectors, uh, can be one of the uh, solutions. I think we have a great uh, panel today. Uh, please join me thanking the panel uh, for, for great insight and opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fujimura and the panelists. Thank you very much. Participate online. Please go back to the timeline and join the next session. Closing remark. The closing remark will start soon. Thank you for your patience. Lastly, Mr. Mizuno Hiromichi, Special Envoy of UN Secretary General on Innovative Finance and Sustainable Investment, will give the closing remark. Mr. Mizuno, would you please come up to the stage?
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hiro Mizuno. I'm a special envoy of United Nations Secretary General on Innovative Finance and Sustainable Investment. On behalf of UN Secretary General, I'd like to thank you for all your effort thrown into this successful event. Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry, METI, and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and the Japanese TCFD Consortium. This is the third successful event to focus the discussion on the TCFD disclosure. UN is trying to promote the, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, which is the, the 17 goals which world agreed to achieve by 2030. And the climate change is one of the most important goal and important agenda for us to achieve to make sure we achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. This year, 2021, is very important year given the momentum created by world leaders, including Prime Minister Suga of Government of Japan, uh, who committed carbon neutral by 2050. Now, all the G7 leaders committed to carbon neutrality by 2050, and the G7, G20 financial ministers agreed to promote the TCFD as the climate disclosure framework. And we are approaching COP26, which all of, all of us understand is gonna be one of the most important COP gathering in the history of a COP discussion. So uh, this is very uh, important timing and uh, we have a strong appreciation for uh, Japanese government and all the people who brought this event together. And uh, having seen the, all the panelists and the speakers who continuously uh, contributed this event, it shows the, uh, the, the world appreciation for uh, the importance of this TCFD summit. So I hope this will continue into 2022 uh, to remain as a forum to discuss the importance and uh, most recent developments of the TCFD disclosure. So today, uh, listening to keynote speakers as well as the, uh, the four panel discussions, there are several important points were made and shared. The first panel discussion we heard from asset owners and asset managers the role of asset managers in the promotion of TCFD disclosure. It has been agreed asset owner should play the key role, but at the same time, asset managers and also the banks and other financial institutions should enable asset owner to promote this agenda. They also discussed the importance of the collective engagement and the continuous and a responsible ownership rather than just uh, divesting the portfolio company out of their portfolio to make the portfolio look more carbon free or a ca less carbon heavy portfolio. And they also confirmed that the, uh, TCF the TCFD will provide the core of the, uh, the any efforts to integrate or standardize the, uh, the climate-related financial disclosure. So uh, it is very encouraging that the, all the panelists to confirm that the, uh, they would recommend all the stakeholders, including financial institutions and uh, corporates, to implement the TCFD disclosure. On the second panel, the effort to improve the quality of TCFD disclosure they even put the, uh, the uh, envelope father talking about importance of the scope three disclosure. We must promote the uh, lifetime assessment of carbon footprint of all the businesses and the investment portfolio. And uh, to achieve that, scope three disclosure will turn the key. And uh, at the moment, even among the, the signatories of TCFD recommendation, very few company already made a scope three disclosure. I totally understand that the uh, practical challenges to do a scope three disclosures, but I think there is a consensus on the panel too that the uh, scope three disclosure will be very, very important 
and uh, how to calculate the scope three number is going to be determined by the discussion uh, among the, uh, the investors as well as the, the policy leaders. Related to that, I think there's an increasing expectation among corporates as well as the, uh, the financial institutions for international effort to standardize matrix. So ISSB's the move and the recent commitment of IF, I, IFRS to bring the, uh, the all the different uh, climate disclosure together are being appreciated. We just need to make sure that the, uh, that's not going to produce new standard <laughs> to make it more complicated or create the sort of a tick box exercise so that everybody wouldn't lose the real principle of the, uh, the scope three disclosure. So on a panel three, we discussed about the uh, TCFD and the transition strategy. And I also discussed on the panel four, the import importance of a transition finance. On one hand, we need to accelerate transition to the, uh, the sustainable energy or sustainable businesses. And uh, some of them define that as a pure green business, a pure green project. But at the same time, we realize that, that there is a need for transition. We can't wait everybody until it becomes realistic for them to turn their business purely green. But we just need to make sure in the meantime, we just need to accelerate a transition to less carbon heavy uh, project or less carbon business, business model. And uh, if we fail to provide the capital to that transition, we will end it up a lot of either greenwashing or just the, uh, the stranded asset. So the importance of a transition strategy has been discussed. And uh, to make the transition finance real or known, not the, uh, the TCFD or ESG washing, we just need to present the, uh, the clear roadmap and also the tradition pathway. So uh, we are gonna push the, uh, the government to create the roadmap for the industry as a whole, and we are going to push the, uh, the each businesses to come up with a clear transition pathway to enable investor to feel confident to providing uh, the capital for transition, not for transition washing. So I think the, uh, the importance of transition and or transition finance has been very clear. And listening to the panel four, it is also the very clear need uh, from the developing part of the world. And we talked about the Trans-Pacific, but in Asia, we see a lot of companies, need, companies and countries need assistance not only political assistance, but also the financial assistance but by the developing country, developed countries. To do that, we think the TCFD or disclosure framework also help us or facilitate more capital flow into developing countries to assist them to transit to the greener economy as soon as possible. And it is particularly encouraging to see that the uh, Mexico creating their own TCFD consortium inspired by Japanese TCFD consortium. So all those kind of effort, we actually need to inspire each other and also help each other to catch up because a lot of them doesn't have enough resource as some others are. So this month, a lot of people start gathering in Glasgow to discuss to, for the, uh, the COP26. Before that, there will be a lot of initiative you'll be hearing on the climate disclosures and the climate finance and all those things you can, you can name. I think that Japan will continue to play a significant leadership in promotion of the CFD. But I just wanted to clarify one point as my closing remark, ultimate goal of TCFD disclosure is not disclosure itself. We are going to make TCFD disclosure 
as a framework where people can gather to discuss issues related to climate change and inform the, uh, the investor to shift the money to trans accelerate the transition and also inform the corporate executive to prepare for possible impact on their businesses. So at the end of the day, ultimate goal of TCFD disclosure is not to embarrass people with the uh, their, their current you know, the risk related to the climate change. It's more about how to facilitate shift in the, cap the capital shift and also the business shift and the shift of the, uh, the people's lifestyle. And that should be guaranteed and also the properly uh, analyzed by the same matrix. And we have really uh, strongly hope that the TCFD recommendation will provide that core framework, and uh, all the participants of this uh, conference will continue to cheerlead, uh, become a cheerleader of a TCFD recommendation. And uh, the more companies and the more, more institutions agree to uh, promote or like agree to uh, produce their TCFD uh, disclosure uh, in their financial reporting, it will become, we will set the ground for the government to make it mandatory. So this is the one of the very few cases in the history of financial uh, industry. Finance, private sector is actually calling for the regulatory intervention to make it mandatory so that they will be able to get to onto their job immediately rather than thinking about what kind of like, a, you know, the rule they have to uh, play with. So thanks again. This is a great opportunity for all of us and um, I think the uh, TCFD sounds very technical, but this provides real incentives and a real motivation for the, all the participants and all the stakeholders to join the forces to promote the, uh, the uh, sustainable economy and a sustainable world. Thanks again, thanks Meti, and uh, thanks uh, TCFD Consortium, and uh, thanks uh, World Business Council of for Sustainable Development and all the participants for your uh, passionate participant and also the, uh, the, all the panelists and the speakers for your insight. It was a great opportunity for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mizuno. Thank you very much. This concludes the TCFD Summit 2021. We will be sending questionnaire to participants today via email. We appreciate your cooperation in filling out the questionnaire. Your opinions will be valuable in planning for and improving the TCFD Summit. Thank you for your face participating in the TCFD Summit 2021 today. I hope you to see you next year in TCFD Summit 2022. Thank you. <laughs>